The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Psalm 14, to the chief musician, a psalm of David. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have become corrupt. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call on the Lord? There they are in great fear, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You shame the counsel of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation of Israel would come out of Zion, when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people. Let Jacob rejoice, and Israel be glad. We are in Deuteronomy 13, verses 6 through 18. This is entitled, You Shall Walk After the Lord Your God, Part 2. Um, I got an email from Beth this morning, and she says, Thank you for doing a sermon of this length. Apparently, it's shorter than other sermons. I wouldn't know that, but she says, Oh, it's always so nice to have a shorter sermon. So there you go. <laughs> I don't know. I just type until the passage is done, and if it's 20 pages or if it's 20, I will say, I will say that one sermon I've got coming up, I think it's on the Feast of Tabernacles, is going to be probably the shortest sermon I've ever done. We're going to be in and out of here in about 15 minutes. Anyway, it's not really, it's, I think it's 17 pages instead of 20 to 25 or, you know, a long sermon would be 28 pages. I know that. But this will be a very short sermon and it'll be, I think, in another eight or nine weeks. Anyway, we are in Deuteronomy 13, 6 through 18. If your brother, the son of your mother, your son or your daughter, the wife of your bosom, or your friend who is as your own soul secretly entices you, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers, of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, you shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him. But you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. And you shall stone him with stones until he dies, because he sought to entice you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. So all Israel shall hear and fear, and not again do such wickedness as this among you. If you hear someone in one of your cities, which the Lord your God gives you to dwell in, saying, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and enticed the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which you have not known. Then you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination was committed among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it, all that is in it, and its livestock with the edge of the sword, and you shall gather all its plunder into the middle of the street and completely burn with fire the city and all its plunder for the Lord your God. It shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. So none of the accursed things shall remain in your hand that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show you mercy. Have compassion on you and multiply you just as he swore to your fathers because you have listened to the voice of the Lord your God to keep all his commandments which I command you today to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord your God. At Christmas time this past year, my friend Tina asked me to do a sermon on the question, why it takes so long to understand grace. She even repeated the question, amending it as she wrote, why is it so hard to understand grace? In asking twice, she was letting me know it was truly important to her. Now, I'm not sure an entire sermon is needed to answer that, and yet, at the same time, I'm not sure that a thousand sermons could answer it as well. The reason why is because every person ever born is an individual. And so every person is going to come to a different level of understanding concerning things like that. 
and we cannot go further than what our limited, finite comprehension then allows. The simple definition of grace is getting what you do not deserve. The very fact that it is undeserved makes it beyond our ability to fully grasp. We may generally understand it, but we cannot fully apprehend the impetus behind the act. The first question is, why does it take so long to understand grace? Surely she is referring to the grace of God. As this is so, it is because the grace of God is infinite. How can we ever explore an infinite? As long as the ages have been, and as long as they will continue to be, we cannot nor will we ever be able to fully peer into what is infinite. We can only see it from what we know, which is finite and limited. The second question, though seemingly easier to answer, is actually more difficult. Why is it so hard to understand grace? Again, she is certainly referring to the grace of God. The answer to the first question is simply a punt. God is infinite, we are not, and so we cannot attain to what God has done. But from our perspective, it seems the second question doesn't bear that limitation. We are finite, and grace has been bestowed upon us. The source of that may be infinite, but the results of it are not. The act has happened, and yet we find ourselves not understanding how it can be. Our text verse comes from Galatians chapter 5. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. The contents of the sermon today are more directed to mercy than to grace. In the context of the passage, God has already redeemed Israel. He has already given them the inheritance. It is the people who are faced with disobeying the word of the Lord who are addressed. What they need is obedience to the word, and the Lord will have compassion on them for acting rightly. But this is the same as those who Paul is addressing in Galatians. They had received the grace of God. They had been saved and sealed. There's no question about that. And yet they had trampled on that grace, returning to the law that Christ had already fulfilled for them. In other words, they had failed to understand grace. Why? The answer is different for those in Rome, for those in Corinth, for those in Galatia, and so on. The Corinthians were given grace, and they immediately turned it into an idol fest of division. They had also had some who turned it into an excuse for license. The Galatians had turned away from it into an idol fest of self. Why can't we understand grace? It is because it is opposed to our very nature. We know how to be gracious, but it always stems back to something that we can receive from it, even if it is to simply obtain a state of personal satisfaction. That made me feel good. We turn from grace because we find it hard to accept that there are no strings attached or that God has somehow failed to benefit from his bestowal of grace. That is completely contrary to why we are gracious. And so we think if God isn't benefiting from this, then it can't be real. If it isn't real, then I need to do something to merit his favor. As a result of this thinking, what do we do? We go back to the personal merit before the Lord, forgetting that personal merit is actually opposed to grace, which we suppose cannot be grace because there was no benefit from the giver of the grace. Not understanding grace is a condition of placing our own finite, failing, and fallible limitations on God, who is none of these things. That means that we need to have the mind of God, not in the sense that we are God and have infinite knowledge, but that we accept that what God says is exactly what God means. And the way that we do that is to read and accept his word in context and at face value. How can we understand grace? I would say that to do so, we must completely ignore our own self and what it means to be the person each of us is, 100%. If we allow ourselves to be the judge of what God's grace means, we will never, never, ever understand what it means. In setting aside the notions of self, we can then accept the gift of God. He has done this. I accept it, and I will not attempt to think it through any further in relation to my own self in order to understand it. 
If we can do that, then we will have all of eternity to no longer claim we understand God's grace, but to simply accept it and then go on in learning what it means as he reveals it to us. Tina, that's the best that I can do. It is an answer that demands that we accept God's word wholly and completely as it is given to us. And I am certain that this is true because God's eternal, unchanging, and ageless word ends on exactly that note. From Revelation 22, verse 21, the last verse of the Bible, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. If God wanted us to understand it from our limited perspective, he would not have ended his word with that. And if he expected us to understand it, he would not have promised us eternity to find out in its fullness what that ending sentence meant. Grace is given, mercy is received, and the fulfillment of the law through Christ our Lord is how those things came to be. And I want you to understand that God gave his son for us. That is grace. We will never understand that forever. What we have to do is accept it. And when he says that you're saved by faith in that act, you have to accept it. That's what I've been trying to tell you for the past three or four minutes. This is a truth that is to be found in his superior word. And so let us turn to that precious word once again. And may God speak to us through his word today. And may his glorious name ever be praised. I have a couple of thoughts for you today. The first is the Lord above all others. It's verses 6 through 11. In the previous passage, Moses spoke of the prophet or dreamer of dreams leading the people away from the way in which the Lord God commanded. In such an instance, he said, that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. In doing this, he said, they would put away the evil from your midst. This is correct, but it is not the end of such an example, even by a long shot. That is a specific example of anyone in general. The world is full of heretics, and such heretics are to be eliminated. However, Moses now goes from the general to the personal. Verse 6, if your brother. The conjunction is a common one. We talked about it last week. Key. It is what opened the chapter in verse 1, and it will be used again to begin the next thought in verse 12. It is widely used and widely translated, but the word if though not being incorrect, may not be the best way of stating the force of the intent. One might say, though your brother. In other words, it seems Moses is assuming the thing has occurred. In this, he will state the law for such an occurrence. He begins with the personal affiliation that is considered one of the closest in all of Scripture, that of a brother. To further define the closeness, he then adds in, verse 6 going on, the son of your mother. In the Bible, like in our own general speaking, the word brother can extend to someone who is actually not related at all. There is a closeness that we feel towards others that brings our affections and allegiances to that of a brother in almost all ways. However, we also use the term blood is thicker than water to demonstrate that there are times when we will tolerate or forgive something from a blood brother that we would not accept in a friend, usually no matter how close of a friend he is. Hence, Moses further defines the relationship for this reason. From there, verse 6 continues, your son or your daughter. The New King James Version leaves off a preposition. It says, o bing ha, o bite ha, or your son or your daughter. It is two different clauses as Moses elevates the importance of the command. One might reject even his own brother, but would he reject his son? It must be so. And even more, his daughter is the weaker sex. The inclination would be to have mercy on her or to say, hey, I'm the parent and I am the stronger. I can impose my will on this person to effect a proper change in her. But Moses will show that such a thought is to be excluded. And from there, he elevates the matter higher. Verse 6 continues, the wife of your bosom. O eshet chechecha, or wife of your bosom. Moses could have just said, or your wife. If so, she may have been at the beginning of this list, not towards the end, because not all men love their wives. But in adding the word hek, or bosom, he is defining a relationship that is so intimate and so loving that it is as if the wife is enclosed in the man. The implication of unfailing love is communicated with this thought. But even that is again elevated. Verse 6 continues, Or your friend, who is as your own soul, the word friend is rea. 
it signifies another. It can be a brother, a friend, a companion, a lover, and so on. Such a person is defined by Moses as Asher Kenafshecha, which as your own soul. This is the one referred to in the Proverbs. He says in Proverbs 18.24, a man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. It is the truly undying love for another without regard to physical intimacy or gender. Such a relationship as this transcends such things and is revealed in the strongest bond of all. It is how the relationship between David and Jonathan is described from 1 Samuel 18. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. So great was David's love that when Jonathan was killed, David said, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. Moses, having brought in the closest of all human relationships, now says that even under such a relationship as that, if that person, verse 6, continues, secretly entices you, Basseter, in the secret. It is a new word in scripture, seter. It is a noun signifying a cover, literal or figurative, and it can be in a positive or a negative sense. It comes from the verb satar, meaning to hide or to conceal. In this act, any such person, no matter how close, comes forward. Verse 6 continues saying, let us go and serve other gods. Lemor nelecha ve na'abda Elohim acharim, saying, let us walk and serve God's other. In other words, any God or any gods other than Jehovah that are brought forward for the purpose of worship. The words here follow in accord with the words of verse 2. There it said, let us go after other gods and serve them. Such gods are, verse 6 continues, which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers. Again, the words are in accord with verse 2 which you have not known. The people are sitting before Moses, the representative of the law of the Lord. They have personally experienced the Lord and they are being instructed in the law of the Lord. Thus the references from this point in their history and it extends out from there for all time. Only Jehovah is known to them and only Jehovah is to be known to them. Such a prohibition is to extend in all directions as well. As Moses says, verse 7, of the gods of the people, which are all around you, near to you, or far off from you. Here the words go from the singular to the plural for just one word, and then back to the singular. From gods of the people, which around you all, near to you, singular, or farthest from you, singular. Moses is ensuring that both the individuals and the nation, the collective people, heed to what is said. Despite the plural being confirmed by the Greek translation of this passage, what that means is the Hebrew has the plural, so does the Greek translation. Everybody got that? It means that it's correct. Despite that, and in a marvelously stupid comment, Cambridge says that the words ought to be deleted. In this, they have elevated themselves to being the arbiters of God's word, claiming that what is presented is subject to their own whims of grammar and of what is to be considered useful or unhelpful concerning instruction. They will be punished. I assure you of this. Verse 7 continues, From one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. From end the earth and unto end the earth. The meaning is obvious, and it is to be understood from both a geographical and a chronological sense, as far as the end of the earth and forever in time. In no place and at no time shall this be tolerated. Rather, verse 8, you shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him. It is an emphatic and pregnant verse made up of five different clauses and more. Moses uses several words that are rather rare. Hence, what he is saying is both grave and it is striking. No, you shall consent to him, and no, you shall listen to him, and no, shall pity your eye him, and no, you shall spare, and no, you shall cover him over. And more, the first two clauses deal with the individual's response to the offender. You shall not consent and you shall not listen to. However, the final three clauses deal with the individual's responsibility toward the offender. Your eye shall not pity, nor shall you spare, and you shall not conceal. The offender is not to be heeded, and the offender is to be dealt with even as an enemy. 
as Moses next says, verse 9, but you shall surely kill him. Moses places a stress upon the requirement, ki harag tahargenu, for killing, you shall kill him. It is to be considered a judicial act because the offender has committed a capital offense. But more, the person who was enticed is, by his actions, placing his allegiance to the Lord above his own human instincts, which would otherwise be to defend someone that he loved so much. But Moses brings in an implied protection for such an action, saying, verse 9 continues, and your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. If a person were to be enticed by another person, and he was to kill him right then and there, it could be argued that he had committed murder and that he had only claimed that he was so enticed in order to kill the person. That is why the law says from Deuteronomy 17, whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. The hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people, so you shall put away the evil from among you. In such a law, there is protection for the offender, and there is also protection for the one who took the Lord's side in the matter. Otherwise, anyone could claim anything and could get away with murder. Or the truly righteous man who took action in his own hands could be accused of murder. This is substantiated by the fact that it notes that not only would the one who heard be required to kill the person, but then it says that all the people were to follow suit. The implication here is that the matter was brought before the congregation. Everybody got that? Don't go killing somebody until you brought it before the judges. However, once the matter was settled, the one who made the initial accusation would be required to back up his words with action. Thus, the punishment would be both a grave responsibility and an implied honor. Now, before I go on, think of what that is implying. He just said, your friend, your son, your daughter, the wife of your own bosom, they secretly entice you away, or even a friend that's closer than any of those to you. And now you have to throw the first stone at that person. Imagine the, the burden and the responsibility of that. Of this law, Charles Ellicott rightly states, the law may seem harsh, but its principle is reproduced in the gospel. If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. It is impossible to deny or escape the identity of the Lord Jesus with the Jehovah of the Old Testament. He does not always put the execution of his judgments into human hands, but he is the same forever. Verse 10, and you shall stone him with stones until he dies. Verse 5 said the prophet or dreamer of dreams who committed such an action was to be put to death. This verse now explains the means of execution. And you shall stone him in the stones and he dies. This is the first of several explicit references to stoning a person in the book of Deuteronomy. But it was already implied in verse 5. The land of Israel is, if you've been there, you know this, it's the rockiest place one can imagine. There is hardly a spot that isn't fit to accomplish this, and it is a means of execution that everyone at hand could, and indeed was expected to, participate in. In this case, the stoning was mandated, verse 10 continues, because he sought to entice you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Though they vary in several ways in both order and words used, what is said here bears great similarity to verse 5. The focus is on one's allegiance to Jehovah, and the explanation for that is, again, that it is he who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Again and again, Moses returns to this same theme. As such, we need to remember the parallel. This is what Christ spiritually did for us. As always, Egypt pictures bondage to sin. Christ Jesus brought us out from that, having redeemed us from that house of bondage. Despite the bloody history, though, of the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of the Saints of Christ has no authority to execute the false prophets or those around us who attempt to draw us away from faith in Christ. But we have the same personal responsibility to love the Lord more than any other person. He alone is to be our greatest desire of the heart and soul. That loving allegiance to him is to be what will hopefully draw others into the same relationship. 
For Israel, however, execution of the offenders was to be its own warning. Verse 11, so all Israel shall hear and fear. The spelling of the word fear bears a strong emphasis. Vekal Yisrael Yishmeru Veyiratun. That N on the end of that word, Yiratun, is an emphasis. And all shall hear and shall certainly fear. In other words, just as any society hears of executions and realizes how serious certain matters are taken, so Israel would take it to heart and be absolutely certain to not do as that offender had done. Such a punishment has a double impact. It removes the wicked from the land, and it causes the people to walk circumspectly. But even that leads to a third benefit. In walking properly, people will revere the Lord who set the standard in the first place. The problem for Israel is never within the law itself, but with the people's inability to uphold the law. As long as the law is upheld, others will see, verse 11 continues, and not again do such wickedness as this among you. Velo yosifu la asot kadavar hara haze bikerbecha. And no shall add to do according to the thing, the evil, the this in your midst. In other words, in executing the offender, it will end any other such attempts by those who are so easily led astray. The precept is no different than countries that execute homosexuals or some other crime. When that is the case, those who may think in that manner would never openly acknowledge it. The standard is set, the law is given, and those who fear the law will exercise restraint. And so it is with any other activity, adultery, drugs, and so on. In executing offenders, the masses will cease the offenses. How do I know that's true? Because I lived in Malaysia. Okay, when you go into that country, they stamp your passport in big red letters, drug trafficking will result in death. That's it. There is one appeal to the king, he denies it, and they hang that person. They have very little problem with drugs in that country. Very little. People do, and then they get hung, and then you don't hear about it for quite a while after that. Okay? That is true. The Bible is supported by this notion in history. Now, you get the liberals in this country that say it's not true, and that it doesn't, it's not a deterrent and all that. Listen, that's baloney. (laughs) Blessed is the one who walks after the Lord his God. And happy is the man who shall see his face. It is on the straight path that he does trod, and it is he who finds the Lord's mercy and his grace. So it is for that man who walks after the Lord his God, and it shall be so even when life appears dark and grim. His feet are faithful, and with righteousness he is shod. He will see good days. Joy and blessing lie ahead for him. Do what is right and pleasing before the Lord, and he will honor you with life and length of days. Be carefully attended to his sacred word and live out your life to his honor and to his praise. This is the path to follow for the discerning and the wise. He who understands is ever pleasing in the Lord's attentive eyes. Our second thought today, what is right in the eyes of the Lord? It's verses 12 through 18. In verses 1 through 5, Moses dealt with apostasy in a general matter. In verses 6 through 11, he dealt with it in a personal matter. Now in verses 12 through 18, he will refer to apostasy in an organized matter, saying, verse 12, if you hear someone in one of your cities. Again, as in verse 1 and verse 6, the translation is probably more rightly rendered, though you hear. It is more assuredly assuming that the thing has occurred, and so action must be taken. In this case, it is an offense that has happened in a city. Further, the word someone does not belong in this verse. It reads, Ki tishma be'achat arecha, though you hear in one of your cities. The words are referring to Israel, the whole, hearing about something that has occurred in one of their cities. And to be more specific, Moses says, verse 12 continues, which the Lord your God gives you to dwell in, saying. This is the same idea as saying, the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In other words, the offense is aggravated by the notion that the city was provided by the Lord. He brought them in. He subdued the nations. He gave them the cities. And yet in one of those cities, verse 13, corrupt men have gone out from among you. The Hebrew is more expressive. Have gone out men, sons of worthlessness, from your midst. The word Beliaal is introduced here. 
It comes from beli, which means failure, and ya'al, which means profit. Thus, it means no profit or worthless. Many scholars and translators render this as a proper name, belial. And indeed, that is how Paul renders it in 2 Corinthians when dealing in a similar matter. He says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And yet throughout the Bible, people describe an object by its predominant characteristic as a son of that quality. For example, the term son of death is used this way at times, such as when David said in 2 Samuel 12, verse 5, as the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this is a son of death. The meaning is that the person deserved to die. Unfortunately for David, he didn't realize that the person he was referring to was himself. That's correct. For now, whether as a noun or a pronoun, the intent is ultimately the same. In this verse in Deuteronomy, the worthless people are said by Moses to have gone out from among you. This doesn't mean within the city, but from among Israel. In other words, the entire city is being contrasted to all of the rest of Israel. This is evident from the next words, verse 13 going on, and enticed the inhabitants of their city. Va yadihu et yoshave iram, and impelled inhabitants their city. The word nadach, or impel, has been used in all three instances found in this chapter. The prophet of verses 1 through 5, the personal close one of verses 5 through 12, and now the worthless men of this section. One might think of beguiling or seducing, even through intimidation. And their words are, verse 13 continues, saying, let us go and serve other gods. The words follow closely after both verse 2 and verse 6. Let us walk after and serve God's other, which you have not known. The offenders are worthless, and they are luring the people away to that which is worthless. This is because they are gods, verse 13 continues, which you have not known. It is the same expression said twice in this chapter already. There is the Lord, the God of Israel, and then there are those gods which the people or the person have not known. The temptation is especially strong for those who may be going through a bad spell, who are struggling with the realities of life, and so on. The thought may be, well, the Lord is our God, but he isn't taking proper care of us. But these guys are promising great things, contentment, abundance, wealth, and so on, if we follow their gods. This is exactly what churches do all the time. And so we can see the progression of thought. The first is the false prophet or dreamer of dreams, whether in Israel or the guy on the street. He has something to offer other than the truth of God in Christ. And then there is the close relative or friend. They see your faith in Christ and they, for whatever reason, want to misdirect you from it. And then there is the city now being addressed. It would equate to an entire church that offers something tantalizing, be it wealth, prosperity, or contentment. Moses is warning the people in basic categories, and we need to be attentive in basically the same categories, from the general to the personal to the organized. Israel knew the Lord, and yet they are being beguiled to walk after another that they did not know. We know the Lord, and yet no sooner do we know him than we are tempted to walk after the Lord in a way we did not know, nor in a way that he has presented himself. For now, and concerning the city which has done what Moses warns against, verse 14, then you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently. Again, the Hebrew is more specific. And you shall seek, and you shall search out, and you shall ask diligently. In this, a new word is introduced, chakar. It signifies to penetrate and thus to examine intimately. The onus is on Israel to do their due diligence and to determine the truth of the matter. Nothing less would be acceptable. Verse 14 going on, and if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination was committed among you, and again, the English fails to convey the force of Moses' words. It more rightly reads, and behold, truth, the thing is established. 
The abomination was committed in your midst. His words are so poignant that what follows must absolutely come to pass. Verse 15, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword. The Hebrew reads forcefully, striking you shall strike the inhabitants of that city with the mouth of the sword. Here, as elsewhere, the sword is spoken of as a devouring instrument. The souls of the people are eaten away as the sword is wielded. The fate of the people who have acted in this way is death, but more, verse 15 continues, utterly destroying it. Haharem ota, devoting it. In other words, the city is to be placed under the ban. It is to be completely destroyed as an act of devotion to the Lord. Nothing living in it was to be taken out. Nothing. Verse 15 continues, and all that is in it and its livestock with the edge of the sword. Every living thing, man, woman, child, and livestock. Of this, Matthew Poole says, incorrectly, to wit, all that are guilty, not the innocent part, such as disowned this apostasy, who doubtless by choice and interest, at least upon warning, would come out of so wicked and cursed a place. This is incorrect. All were held guilty regardless of their innocence. Once the matter was discovered, does anybody know the story of Achan and the the uh, valley, Joshua chapter 7, there you go. He had children that weren't a part of what he did. Everything under the ban is destroyed. All right, once the matter was discovered, it was to be all, all of it, utterly destroyed with the mouth of the sword. The place was accursed, and so all that lived within it was under the ban. Further, verse 16, and you shall gather all its plunder into the middle of the street and completely burn with fire the city and all its plunder for the Lord your God. The act of devotion to the Lord is to extend to everything within the city. It was to be taken to the Rehov, or broad open place, such as a plaza. It was the, to then be piled up, and the entire city was to be burned. The word completely is Khalil. It signifies all, as in a holocaust, or a whole burnt offering. Thus, the act of devotion to the Lord would be complete in its scope. But it was also to be forever in its duration. Verse 16 continues, it shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. Here the word tell or mound is introduced. It is a contraction of the word talal, which is found in Ezekiel 17 verse 22, where it speaks of a prominent mountain. Thus, this is a mound or a heap. Today, many cities or sites are known by the word, such as Tel Aviv. It is a place where a mound exists upon which more has been built over the years. In the case of such a city, however, it was not to be built upon. The mound itself was to be a testament to the apostasy of the city and of the devotion of that city to the Lord by the people. The mound was to serve as its own witness for all time. And there is an important reason for this mandate, as Moses next relays. Verse 17, so none of the accursed things shall remain in your hand. The word translated here as remain signifies to cling to. The idea is that if any accursed thing were kept, it wouldn't just be in the person's hand, but it would cling to it. The stain of it could no more be taken away than could the shame of an adulterous woman. The Lord would see the thing and it would then withhold any favor from him. This will be seen in Joshua when Achan will take an accursed thing, it clung to him. It found him out, and he and all he possessed, all his family, everything in turn, became subject to the ban. Thus, the people were to completely rid themselves of the banned city. This was so, verse 17 continues, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger. Le ma'an yashuv Yehovah mecharon apo. To end purpose will turn Yehovah from burning his nose. The Lord is truly angry at the actions of such people. It is as if fire shoots from his nostrils as he fumes over their actions. And this isn't a state that may arise. It is a state that exists over their sins. In destroying the, before I go on, aren't you glad to know Jesus Christ? I'm telling you what, you read these things and you think on the severity of God's anger at sin. And you look at the grace that is bestowed upon us. And you wonder why Tina asks, why is it so hard to understand grace? because this is what we deserve. And God doesn't benefit in any way, in any shape, or in any form by what he has done for us. It is purely grace. Yes. When we give grace, it always makes us feel better. We got something out of it. God doesn't feel. 
There's no increase in God. There's no decrease in God. God is. Everybody got that? Yes. We just move from one side of him to the other. From If he was a firm column, we'd be on the good side. Well, we move to the bad side or vice versa. But God does not change. Thank God for Jesus Christ. In destroying the city, devoting it to complete destruction, his anger over the infraction ends, symbolized by the thought of turning, which is what happened for us when Christ went to the cross. The enmity ended. His anger ceased in Christ. Where there was confrontation and enmity, there is again peace and solicitude. This verse is exactly what we see in the account of Achan in Joshua. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Achan's grave of stones became its own tell. And in destroying him, as was just and proper, the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, exactly as this verse in Deuteronomy proclaims. Though the cause of the anger was different, the expected punishment, that of devotion to the Lord, was the same. When the devotion is made, the enmity ceases. In this restored state, the Lord will turn, verse 17 going on, and show you mercy. Venatan lecha rachamim, and give you mercies. The plural, mercies, is intended to show that upon those who are abundantly faithful, there will be a multitude of mercies. The unceasing stream of the favor of the Lord is opened when faithfulness to him is demonstrated. In this he will, verse 17 going on, have compassion on you and multiply you, just as he swore to your fathers. The idea is that in the destruction of an entire city, a number that could go into the high thousands, there will be a diminishing of the tribe and of the nation. And yet, because of the faithfulness of the people to the Lord, he will turn and bless them through multiplication so that there will be no gap in the tribe or in the nation. And the reason for this is because of the oath to the fathers. The Lord spoke, and he would carefully remember his promise when the people lived in obedience to his word. He would multiply their seed as a sign of his divine favor. Of this act of harem, or devotion, being restored to the people, John Lang states, Holiness, as it makes its demand through righteousness, must receive satisfaction, and therewith mercy can follow. The enlargement should counterbalance the loss occasioned by the punishment. With this happier tone restored to the nation through their faithful obedience, Moses affirms why restoration could be expected. Verse 18 finishes with, Because you have listened to the voice of the Lord your God, to keep all his commandments which I command you today, to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord your God. Again, as has been seen throughout Deuteronomy, Moses states that what he commands equates to listening to the voice of the Lord. In other words, he is claiming, and the Bible is affirming, the doctrine of divine inspiration. In obeying Moses, the people are listening to, meaning hearkening to, the voice of the Lord. What Moses says is right in his eyes. What this means is that everything he says, meaning Moses, everything he says is right. Obedience to the law is not deserving of a pat on the back for Israel for some issues, but then not something to worry about for others. It is a unified whole, and it must be taken as such. Apart from the matter of Achan in the book of Joshua, the closest Israel ever came to the matter described here is at the end of the book of Judges, where a city of the tribe of Benjamin was found to be filled with sons of Belial, or sons of worthlessness. In order to purge the evil from Israel, the entire nation came against them, but the tribe of Benjamin sided with their own people. Thus, the tribe of Benjamin was reduced to only 600 men. However, they eventually regained their numbers and noted biblical figures came from them, including Saul, Israel's first king, and the apostle Paul. Throughout the Bible, there is seen grace and mercy mingled with judgment and punishment. But every infraction of the law demanded punishment before the mercy could be bestowed. This truth extends to all people. Judgment for sin against the holy God cannot be overlooked, but it can be meted out in a substitute. Israel as a whole deserved judgment for the apostasy of one city, but the destruction of the city could appease the Lord. The sins of the people required judgment, but the penalty could be taken out on an innocent substitute, such as in the temple sacrifices and especially on the Day of Atonement. And those things only look forward to the greater work of Christ, who is the fulfillment of those mere types and pictures. Each of us has a choice. 
and each of us must decide how we will come before this holy God. Will we attempt to stand before him on our own merits? The thought is impossible to even consider. Let us act in prudence and let us choose the wise option. Let us come to God through Jesus. It is he who has already paid the penalty for the sins of the world. The full cup of God's wrath was brought to bear on him on the tree of Calvary, and indeed he bore it all. In this, God's wrath was satisfied. The payment was made, and peace is now offered through his deed. Let us remember what Christ has done. Let us receive it as our own, and let us stand before God forgiven and free of the sins we have committed in his presence. And let us thank God for Jesus Christ now and forever. Let us hail our Lord to the glory of God the Father. I will tell you that these people that are out there in the world today and are trying to push this agenda, which we heard about in the Prophecy Update today, Max Lucado is going along with it. He doesn't, that guy has no comprehension of the judgment of God. Mm -hmm. If he would even dare to equivocate or to waffle on what he once said about what the word proclaimed, you cannot do that. I'm telling you, that is a scary place to be. And I'm not saying the guy's not saved. But he is playing with fire by saying those type of things because judgment must come. And as I said during the sermon, I am so thankful for Jesus because everything we're reading here, I'm not giving you the typology, but I think you can see it. It all pictures Christ. Something has to be judged and it has to be done willingly by the people before the Lord will relent. Well, God did the work in his son and now he simply asks us to believe that. Yesterday when we were in the projects, I talked to somebody that hasn't talked to us in a long time. There's a Muslim guy, and, you know, he, he used to come out and uh, uh, talk to us, and he'd let us pray with him. And one day, because he speaks Arabic, I gave him a track from Usama, you know, and he never spoke to us again. That was it. He did not want to hear that. And when he sees us, it's like we got the COVID, Pa. He'd run inside. But yesterday, he came out, and we said, you want to pray? And he says, only if you let me pray for you through Allah. And I said, that's not going to happen, but we can stand here and at least talk. And we talked for a while and he started talking about God and God's going to judge everybody. And I said, that's true. But I said, it's not Islam's judgment where you have 51 and 49 and you get to go and you don't get to go. It is one and all are condemned already. That is it. We're already condemned. There is no weighing of the balances like Islam proclaims. There's no bell curve like a lot of these churches in Sarasota proclaim. There is one standard, and that standard is Jesus Christ, because we're all already falling. As I said earlier, during the Prophecy Update, go read John 3.18. Let's read it together. And then you'll understand. I mean, this is Jesus' words. This isn't even something that, you know, oh, that's Old Testament stuff. We don't need to worry about that. We'll go to Jesus' words in John chapter 3 and verse 18. He who believes in him, meaning Jesus, is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Big difference between Islam and Christianity. And he's trying to lump us all together. And I say, you're, you're talking Catholicism there, buddy. That has nothing to do with us. And then he started getting into the Jews. And they're all, I said, listen, man's unfaithfulness has no bearing on God's faithfulness. And he stopped and he went, he, he just, he didn't know how to respond to that one. Yeah. And they started arguing about something else. It doesn't matter what we believe. If God says he's going to do something, he's going to follow through with that. He promised that he would follow through with the Jewish people. And it doesn't make any difference whether they're bad or not, whether they're ruling the world or whatever. It doesn't make any difference. Amen. The only thing that matters is that God has spoken and he will perform. He will never talk to us. He will never talk to us again. I know that. But anyway, we'll, uh, we'll just make sure that everybody here understands that Jesus Christ is the way. It's kind of a bitter sermon if you think about it, but at the same time, it's the mercy of God. It's the grace of God in Jesus Christ. You can't understand that at all unless you understand what his standard is. And as I tried to say at the beginning of this sermon in very failing terms, we will never, ever understand it, ever. We will go on forever and for all of eternity being amazed at what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So please call on Christ today. I got a closing verse here for you from Psalm 128. It is verse 1. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Next week is Deuteronomy 14, 1 and 2. It's only two verses. How do we become a part of this squad? It's entitled Sons of the Lord God. That'll be our 44th Deuteronomy sermon. Yes, I'm going to bring in the Nephilim for this one. 
Ooh, 10 billion views on YouTube until they get to the part where they disagree and then they click off. Bunch of bad comments. I don't care. The word of God isn't to be compromised out of sensationalism. The Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. But he also has expectations of you as he prepares you for entrance into his land of promise. And so follow him and trust him and he will do marvelous things for you and through you. Okay? Uh, we've got a poem for you, but before I give that to you, uh, today we mentioned a relationship who is as one's own soul. Jonathan was that to David, calling him brother. Where does it say that of us? Where does it say, my handwriting is appalling. Where does it say that of us in relation to the Lord in the New Testament? We are brothers of the Lord. Anybody? You got a car you can drive home if you can just simply get that in your memory. We're in a brother relationship with Christ. You know, I don't, I don't recommend people saying, hey, Christ is my brother. I don't do that. I hear people say that from time to time based on this verse. We are in a brotherly relationship, but he is our Lord. Okay, so here's what it says in Hebrews 2.11. Nobody got that today. Um, for it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Saying, and then he quotes the psalm, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praises to you. We are brought into a that type of a relationship with the Lord. But once again, don't use that as a call to say, hey, bro, when you see him. that's He is our Lord. He is to be honored. Okay? Definitely. A poem, you shall walk after the Lord your God. If your brother, the son of your mother, your son or your daughter... The wife of your bosom or your friend who is as your own soul secretly entices you saying, let us go and serve other gods which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers. Such a person is out of control. Of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, you shall not consent to him or listen to him, such you shall not do. Nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him. But you shall surely kill him for trying to mislead the sheeple. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. And you shall stone him with stones until he dies, because he sought to entice you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage where once you trod. So all Israel shall hear and fear, so they shall do, and not again do such wickedness as this among you. If you hear someone in one of your cities, which the Lord your God gives you to dwell in, saying, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and entice the inhabitants of their city, thus relaying, Let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known. Then you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently. On such a deed, light must be shown. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination was committed among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it, all that is in it, and its livestock with the edge of the sword, so you shall do. And you shall gather all its plunder into the middle of the street, then completely burn with fire the city and all its plunder for the Lord your God. It shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again, but it shall lay beneath the sod. So none of the accursed things shall remain in your hand, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger." and show you mercy, have compassion on you, and multiply you, just as he swore to your fathers as a deep, sweet clangor. Because you have listened to the voice of the Lord your God, to keep all his commandments which I command you today, to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord your God, to do according to all the words I say. Lord God, turn our hearts to be obedient to your word. Give us wisdom to be ever faithful to you. May we carefully heed each thing we have heard. Yes, Lord God, may our hearts be faithful and true. And we shall be content and satisfied in you alone. We will follow you as we sing our songs of praise. Hallelujah to you, to us your path you have shown. Hallelujah. We shall sing to you for all of our days. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the chance to study what your nature truly is and what it demands in relation to us. And then we should fear 
we should fear with a great fear and come on our knees humbly to the throne of grace where the mercy can be bestowed, where Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Thank you for that opening for us. And Lord, we have Ahmed in the projects who's so steeped in Islam, thinking that it's the end and the goal of all people. And yet it's just, it's a sad path that will only take him to the pit of death. And so, Lord, we would pray for him today and for his whole family that you would do something earth-shattering in his life to bring him to you and so that he can understand that Islam is not the answer, that in fact it's only a path to the pit. Lord, we pray this, that he will be saved and that his family will be as well. And for all the other people that we see in our lives throughout the week, people we come into contact with at work, people that we come in contact with maybe at the store or just along life's highway, that we see from day to day. Lord, we pray for them. May their eyes be open to your holiness and to the judgment that must be meted out in them if it's not meted out for them. May it be so to your glory and to your honor, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we get the instruction for the Lord's Supper directly from Scripture. Paul writes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And he would have blessed that. He would have said, Baruch atha Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam ha'motzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he would have blessed us as well. He would have said, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Borei Peri HaGuffin. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Last one. Last one. Kind of hoping somebody drive that brand new thing home today. Yeah, well, that's all right. We should be able to fill these up just a little bit more. Oh, yeah, just a little. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise Jesus.
break him out. <laughs> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Got your CEUs done yet? Good, good. Praise the Lord. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give Jody our hellos. I know she's still out doing her thing. She'll be back tomorrow. I know. Let her know we're thinking of her. Okay. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Ah, wow. Long week. I'm telling you what, I, I had a long week. Sergio had a long week. You wouldn't believe how much time he put into getting this thing back online. And he did it all remotely. I don't know how he does it. Unbelievable. But we got... Uh, Manny and his wife and daughter at the beginning of the service that we want to pray for, and uh, we'll just go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, you know the prayer requests that were mentioned then, and you also know the work that Sergio did this past week and how, how tireless his efforts are to keep this church going, and we're grateful for that and for Rhoda, who's right there with him through the whole process. And Lord, thank you for every person that's helped out this church, offered to help out this church that continues to help it out. We're very grateful. Lord, it's your word. We're so thankful that we have it and that it can be preached. And we would pray that you would keep this avenue open and uh, until whatever time is determined, but hopefully right up until the rapture and we're taken home. And until then, we'll just keep doing our best to get this word out because it's an important word. Christ, Christ our Lord, he's the one that took the judgment that we deserve. Every one of us has done what today's passage has said in one way or another. And we need to just understand that and we need to put our hope and our trust solely in Christ and the grace that was poured out on us. Thank you for that. We love you. We just praise you for it. And we do so in his name. Amen. Amen.